Now on BBC News, it's time for cyber crimes. Could computer code destroy our way of life? What if a cyber weapon shut down the power grid of a major city, or derailed a train, or sabotaged our financial systems? You could imagine a series of attacks which would just paralyze a country and create pandemonium. If some country does attack the US or the UK and they turn off the traffic lights or they bring down a plane, there's going to be very serious consequences there. It was once thought that a cyber attack on our critical infrastructure was the stuff of science fiction. Now experts believe the threat is very real. It's called cyber war, a coordinated assault on computer networks that would leave its victim absolutely powerless to retaliate. I'm afraid there are nations, many nations, ready for cyber war to attack. There is no nation which is ready to protect. Now there is troubling evidence that a cyber weapon has been unleashed on an unsuspecting enemy. It's been named Stuxnet, and since its discovery in 2010, it's rewritten the rules of engagement in warfare. Stuxnet seems to herald the beginning of a new and dangerous era. So, are we sleepwalking into a global arms race with cyberspace as the battleground? And could that lead to Cybergeddon? The story of a computer worm called Stuxnet is one of the most disturbing cyber attacks I've ever encountered. Not least because so much about it still remains a mystery. So let's start. We still don't know who wrote Stuxnet. We don't know for certain the target, and we don't have any concrete evidence that it worked. But we do have evidence that it existed. In fact, here it is, half a megabyte of weaponized code, the most sophisticated and cleverest virus in the history of mankind. This is how it was discovered. On the June 17, 2010, Sugei Lassin, head of a Belarusian IT security firm, receives an email from an Iranian client in Tehran complaining of an unusual problem. The client's PCs keep freezing and rebooting. Ulasin is intrigued. Even computers with recently installed Windows software are suffering the same problems. Over the next month, he discovers the cause, an ingenious piece of malicious software, or malware. On July the 12th, 2010, he posts his findings on his website and a popular security forum. With the worm's cover blown, it now needed a name. Stuxnet, an anagram of part of its exotic code, was quickly adopted. A movie star name for a very tough adversary. The race was now on to unravel its code and to find out how and why it was created. Not far from the fevered imaginations of Hollywood is virus hunter Liam Omerchu, the man security firm Symantec tasked with the toughest job in cyberspace. A normal threat that we look at, you could analyze it in, in 30, 30 minutes, no problem. A complex threat maybe might take a day. We spent six months on Stuxnet and we had somebody working on it every hour of every day. It's a huge, huge challenge. Liam and his team discovered Stuxnet was exploiting flaws in software called zero-day vulnerabilities. With a zero-day vulnerability, it means that nobody knows about it yet, nobody has patched it yet, so there's no protection really um, from the vendors against it yet. So any time previous to that, in the last 10 years, we've only ever seen malware use one zero-day vulnerability at a time because they're, they're quite precious. Yeah. Here we had Stuxnet using four zero-day vulnerabilities. It was unheard of, you know, it was just blowing anything else out of the water. And then suddenly, there's this thing which is so sophisticated and so potentially dangerous and you're not playing with the big boys. There was definitely some very chilling moments when we were doing the analysis because we didn't know exactly what was being targeted at first. Mm. We knew it was critical infrastructure. We knew it was, it was something to do with industrial control systems. It could have been a gas pipeline. It could have been a water treatment facility. We didn't know. 
Here's what Liam and his team managed to find out. Stuxnet faked its way into Windows-based computers by using two stolen digital certificates. These certificates are like passports for computer code. Once in, Stuxnet lay dormant, hiding out until the infected PC was connected to another computer. To his amazement, Liam realized it was this computer, called a Programmable Logic Controller, or PLC, that was actually the intended target. Not only that, but it seemed that Stuxnet was designed to specifically attack the PLCs from a specific company. You may have heard of them, they're really quite big. With over 350,000 employees worldwide and global revenues of $80 billion, if Stuxnet had successfully infected a Siemens industrial computer, well, it really could be anywhere. Why was Stuxnet targeting these computers? I've bought a second-hand Siemens controller on eBay just to get to grips with what we're looking at. Make no mistake, it's devices like these that really control the modern world. I mean, it's not very sexy, it's just a black box, there's no touch screen or anything, but PLC controllers control pretty much every automated system in manufacturing, transport, food, even uranium enrichment. After months of cyber sleuthing, Liam's team finally worked out that Stuxnet was only after one industry, uranium enrichment, used to produce nuclear fuel and bombs. The next question was where? A big clue was the discovery that 60% of the infected PCs came from Iran. And that made a lot of sense because Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, president from 2005 to 2013, was seen by the West as a dangerous agitator, hell-bent on trying to make a nuclear bomb at all costs. One of the possibilities for a target for the Stuxnet attack was the nuclear reactor here at Bashir, but perhaps more likely was the project here at Natanz, on the edge of the desert. Now, Natanz is a very strange place, as you can see from this satellite image. It's a very high security building. There are fences around it, and even the main highway that goes past it has these raised banks to prevent anybody from driving past and looking in. In fact, underneath 25 feet of cement and concrete is the uranium enrichment plant itself. Now, although this is a secret project in a secret installation in the middle of the desert, we know about it because President Ahmadinejad of Iran visited and brought a photographer. Here he is, proudly showing off the nuclear centrifuges. Each one of these centrifuges is controlled by a PLC. Now, is there a smoking gun for Stuxnet? Well, maybe yes, because on the Iranian president's website, he released this photograph of him looking at the control panel to the centrifuges. And what does it show? Many of them aren't working. Could that be the result of Stuxnet? Many analysts are convinced that the gray boxes on these monitors represent serious technical issues at Natanz. And without naming Stuxnet or Natanz directly, Ahmadinejad himself finally admitted in November 2010 that a cyber attack had caused issues with their centrifuges. So if Stuxnet is to blame, what was it doing to cause such catastrophic failure? I've come to Stockholm to meet Mikko Hippinen. In 2010, he provided classified briefings on how this groundbreaking worm functioned what these were controlling were high-frequency power converters made by two different companies. And those power converters were spinning the centrifuges, which were enriching uranium gas. Those centrifuges are very delicate. They have to spin at the right frequency, at the right cycles. You know, it's very complicated to get fuel-grade uranium, even more difficult to get weapons-grade uranium. Even the slightest change in the spinning speeds will disrupt the process or potentially even break up these centrifuges. And if you look at the history of the Iranian nuclear enrichment process, 
they had remarkable problems with their centrifuges breaking up and needed to get replaced, most likely because of the delicate sabotage done with Stuxnet. Stuxnet had two payloads. One altered the spinning speed of the centrifuges, causing them to break. The second, called a man-in-the-middle attack, hid the actions of the first payload by presenting normal data to the operators. Now it started recording the network traffic, recorded it for a day or two, and then started playing it back while it started modifying the actual operations of what this PLZ was controlling. That must have been incredibly depressing for everybody working there. One of the targets of the attackers was to make the Iranians feel stupid or feel incompetent. They actually ended up firing tons of their researchers because they couldn't get the process running right. How, how can we be sure that it actually worked? Hmm. I mean, maybe the Iranian engineers were incompetent. Maybe they couldn't get the centrifuges to work. Hmm. I don't actually have a very good answer. I, I don't really know. We know they had massive problems, and it's easy to estimate that they were caused by this. But they are still missing pieces in this puzzle. Mm. The impact of Stuxnet is momentous. By infecting the very computers that control the modern world, the concept of cyber war has moved one step closer to reality. So, what damage could a cyber weapon like Stuxnet do if it was unleashed on our critical infrastructure. What if a country attacked the power grid and then at the same time it caused trains to derail and a chemical plant to release some sort of lethal gas? I don't want to overstate the threat. Um, I think already just one attack on the power grid would be very concerning because the power grid is liable to what we call cascading failures. So for example, let's say you attack the power grid in a part of California, there's a really good chance that you would probably take out parts of northern Mexico and maybe some neighboring states as well. So a small attack, um, because of the nature of how these power grids are connected, can have cascading effects. So did Stuxnet simply come out of the blue? Or is there evidence of the use of other cyber weapons? I've come to Washington DC to meet Peter Singer, an expert on modern warfare. He believes an Israeli mission in 2007 called Operation Orchard holds the key to how cyber weaponry will be deployed in conventional warfare. We're in a period a lot like World War I, where you know, back then they had the tank, they had the airplane, they had the radio, but the big thing they hadn't figured out was how to bring them all together. Operation Orchard is a great illustration of the possibilities in the realm of cyber espionage and warfare. So essentially what happens is a Syrian uh, government official makes a big mistake. He takes his laptop with him to London and leaves it in his hotel room. Israeli intelligence breaks into the hotel room, finds out what's on the laptop. And as they're going through it, they see a lot of interesting things, um, files that this guy should not have brought with him. And among them is a picture of a Arabic gentleman in the desert with an Asian gentleman. The Israelis track down the identity of these two folks and find out, whoa, we've got two individuals, uh, one Syrian and the other is North Korean, who work in atomic research and they're posing out in the desert and they piece together the Syrians are doing nuclear bomb research. Israeli warplanes destroyed an industrial building near Al-Kibar, Syria. The Israelis decided to launch airstrikes to destroy Syria's nuclear capability, a secret laboratory at Al-Kibar, 250 miles northeast of Damascus. But Operation Orchard would employ a radical new approach. The old way you do an airstrike is you'd, you'd fly in, you'd knock down all the air defenses, take out their missiles, their radar sites, and then some smaller part of your strike package would then drop the bombs. It would take, you know, well over a hundred aircraft to do this. Instead, the Israelis, through cyber and electronic means, turn the Syrian air defense network traitor. Not the individuals within it, but their technology. It's still not confirmed what exact method the Israelis employed, but a cyber attack managed to hack into the Russian-made radar systems and render them useless. Well, the radar operator is looking at his screen, and tonight, like every other night, nothing's happening except 
Israeli jets are flying overhead. And so the Syrians reportedly don't find out about the attacks until literally the bombs are dropping on that nuclear research site hundreds of miles into the border. So the Israelis were able to carry out the mission in a new way with a much a more subtle but more effective strike than they could have done previously. All of these things coming together makes it the quintessentially 21st century kind of operation. Jet planes and bomb craters are pretty hard to conceal, even for the Israelis. Operation Orchard was an act of war against the neighbor and was never denied. But attributing secret weaponized code like Stuxnet is far trickier, even though it might just be possible to guess who was behind it. The United States and Israel have been repeatedly connected to launching this cyber weapon. After all, both nations continue to be openly hostile to Iran's nuclear ambitions. According to articles in the New York Times, Stuxnet was allegedly part of a joint mission called Operation Olympic Games, begun in the Bush era and accelerated under President Obama. Thanks to Edward Snowden, we also know that the US was actively involved in developing offensive cyber weapons and a list of potential targets. Was Stuxnet, therefore, one of them? There are few people prepared to publicly connect the US and Israel to Stuxnet. However, Russian cybersecurity legend Eugene Kaspersky is one of them. Uh, it looks like uh, the media is right, talking about Israel and the United States. Maybe yes. I don't have any data to prove that, but it smells, it looks the same what was uh, announced, uh, disclosed by American media. Neither the US nor Israel has ever officially confirmed their involvement in creating and deploying Stuxnet. No wonder. Unlike bombs and bullets, a cyber weapon like Stuxnet is totally deniable. And that's the single most troubling aspect of this story. To understand why, we need to go back to when the concept of warfare was simpler. I'm in the ruins of St. Dunstan in the East, in the city of London. On the 10th of May, 1941, a wave of German planes blew it up with high explosive bombs. The Nazis wanted to destroy London for two reasons. Strategically, they wanted to win the war, but psychologically, they wanted to cow the British public into surrendering. But there's no doubt into what they did or who did it. I mean, the evidence is all around us even 70 years later. But if no one will admit to unleashing Stuxnet, what does that do to our understanding of warfare? And if the use of cyber weapons is so difficult to attribute to a country, does that make them more likely to be used? With Stuxnet setting a dangerous precedent, most experts believe we're at a point in history where these issues need to be urgently addressed. I'm afraid that Stuxnet, oh, cyber weapons, it's a worst innovation of the century because they, they, they are opening the Pandora box. I think there's a big enforcement problem. When you're talking about chemical facilities, well, you know, you can send inspectors in, you can fly planes over, you can see what's being built, you can see what's happening. So that's what's so tricky about cyber weapons, is how do you enforce that? We have seen more than 100 nations create some kind of cyber military capability, some kind of cyber command. Uh, in the Middle East, for example, Iran didn't just go, well, we've been hit, that's that. They ramped up their cybersecurity and cyber warfare programs, both within their military, within the Revolutionary Guard, even creating a bunch of new university programs. Six months after Stuxnet was found, I did a little test. I went online to find Stuxnet on my own. Five minutes of Googling, and I had Stuxnet. So that's one of the things we were really worried about. They would be copycats, maybe extremists would take the actual copy of Stuxnet and modify it. Not everyone is convinced. In 2013, academic Thomas Ridd published the book Cyber War Will Not Take Place. As suggested by the title, his aim is to approach a sensational subject rationally and for us all to keep calm and carry on. All of the militaries around the world, all of the politicians around the world have been talking about cyber war being the next big threat 
Are they wrong? I think they are wrong. Um, it's now 2014. Uh, we've had this announcement that cyber war is coming for more than 20 years now. So I think it's time to actually look at the facts and look at the record. We've never seen a major attack that actually destroyed a physical system. So a lot of people are wedded to the idea. One reason why they're wedded to the idea is because you can actually make uh, money with it. You can, you can strengthen your own influence if, of an individual or an organization. Because then you can, you can save budgets if you slap cyber across it. Uh, it's a politically clever move to do that. The more senior the people are who talk about cyber war, the more highly pitched the rhetoric is. And the more senior the people are who talk about cyber security, cyber operations, cyber weapons, the less, usually, the less they understand of the technical details. We shouldn't be worried about terrorist groups, for example, <laughs> or, or gangs of amateurs somewhere destroying our critical national infrastructure via the medium of the internet. Cyber 9-11, I think, is an unlikely scenario. That is also because blowing up a bomb is such a powerful message. Seeing people with their limbs torn off, blood, panic everywhere, is just a powerful emotional message that is practically impossible to replicate. Any cyber attack, any highly sophisticated attack that tries to damage something, will look like an accident at first glance and then somebody has to come in and say, wait, this is actually not an accident. I did this to you. It's hard to do. The most devious thing about Stuxnet is that the damage it inflicted was actually meant to look like an accident, humiliating the nuclear scientists and frustrating their belligerent president. So how did this worm get inside the building in the first place? Like other critical infrastructure, the greatest protection the Tans had wasn't the 25 feet of concrete above the facility. It was what is called an air gap, the physical separation of its internal computers from the outside world. Investigative reporter Brian Krebs was the first to break the news of Stuxnet in 2010. Yeah, well, I should stress it is just a theory. I think the most likely explanation is somebody carried it in. Um, most of these networks are fairly well segmented. Um, they tend to take that issue very seriously. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that, they're, that they've thought of everything. Uh, and it, all they needed was one USB port somewhere. Um, and if you, anywhere you have ridiculous numbers of computers, you're going to have a lot of USB ports. My sense is that's probably how it got in. Um, and if somebody on the inside had physical access, just slipped it in and pulled it out, and that would have been enough. A humble USB thumb drive might be responsible for crossing the air gap and triggering the first cyber weapon in history. That's extremely worrying, because in 2011, the US Department of Homeland Security conducted an experiment. USB drives were dropped in government parking lots across the states. Incredibly, up to 90% of the drives that were picked up were then inserted into government computers. If cyber war should ever happen, it might be blamed on human curiosity and, I hate to say it, a fair dose of stupidity. We're seeing shifts in the where of war. We're seeing shifts in the who of war. The one shift we're not seeing is in the why of war. War, whether it's with drones, cyber weapons, or guns and knives, is still driven by some kind of human failing, some kind of human mistake, human greed, human aggression, human miscalculation. That's the part that's not changing. As in London, here in Berlin, there are a few moving reminders of past conflicts. A cyber war, should it happen, would leave far less evidence behind. Just like Stuxnet, the perpetrator might never own up to their crimes. Future generations would have little to learn from our mistakes. During the Cold War, Checkpoint Charlie was the epicenter of a massive squaring up of military hardware between the Soviets and the West. Thousands of soldiers, tanks and nuclear missiles were stationed across each other in a divided Germany. For decades, it seemed that the world was on the brink of complete annihilation. But in the end, nothing happened. Nuclear war was averted because everyone knew the cost. 
the prospect of a cross-border face-off between two U.S. B-sticks carrying cyber weapons is not nearly as threatening as a five megaton nuclear missile on the back of a lorry. And so, as a consequence, keeping the cyber piece will be much harder than keeping the nuclear piece. Still, if you do find one of these in your company's car park, there is one thing that you can definitely do. Next time, I'm going to tell the story of how Edward Snowden managed to steal a trove of top secret documents from the most powerful intelligence gathering agency in the world. If you'd like to understand more about how cybercrime affects each and every one of us, the Open University has created a series of easy to understand visual explanations of our digital world. To find them, go to bbc.com slash cybercrimes and follow the links to the Open University.